In Intro to Biochemistry, you've been introduced to several biomolecules so far in the order of which it is processed into energy. First was carbohydrates, then there were lipids, and then there's proteins. Proteins make up a large portion of muscles in the human body, and in turn, proteins are made up of a large variety of amino acids. So, if muscles were to break down, there would be a large amount of amino acids within the body. This occurrence is seen in real life when working out. To gain muscle, muscle has to break down first in order to rebuild a stronger version of itself. During this process, there's excess amino acids within the body. Protein powder can also have the same effect. Molecularly speaking, how does the release of amino acids from muscles occur? Recall lactic acid buildup from the beginning of the quarter. If we work out, lactic acid forms through anaerobic means, and if it's not eliminated, there's a burning sensation due to oxygen deprivation within the muscle. Previously, we learned that the Cori cycle helps to remedy the situation. However, the glucose alanine cycle can also help. By converting the pyruvate created by glycolysis to alanine, we can then break muscle down into amino acids and subsequently ammonia. So why are excess amino acids a problem for the body? Let's look at its structure. The standard form of amino acids consists of a carboxyl group, an amino group, a central carbon, one hydrogen, and an R group variant. While the carbon skeleton of this biomolecule can easily become a metabolic intermediate in processes such as gluconeogenesis and the TCA cycle, the amino group is not as simple to process. The reason for this complication is because the ammonia within the nitrogen group is considered toxic to all animals and must be degraded and excreted. But we can't easily carry ammonia through the body on its own without serious bodily harm. So methods like transamination, oxidative deamination, and glutamine transport can help ammonia travel through the body safely. For the purposes of BCH100 though, we'll be discussing transamination specifically. Transamination is the transfer of ammonia from one molecule to another with an aminotransferase enzyme and a PLP coenzyme, ultimately allowing the nitrogen group to be passed on to glutamate and enter the liver. You will notice that the molecules you have learned from the past take part in this course and can reattach themselves in different ways to form new molecules. Look closely and you'll be able to follow the reattachment. There are two types of transamination mentioned in this course, ALT or alanine aminotransferase, and AST, aspartate aminotransferase. But what's so important about ALT and AST? It can actually help indicate possible liver problems. Since transamination occurs in the liver, a high activity of the process can actually show high levels of ALT and AST, indicating some sort of abnormality within the organ. Lastly, it's necessary to highlight that transamination is also reversible. Can you think of a reason why? Here's a hint. What does the body need? Ultimately, at the end of all three processes, the ammonia gets transferred to the liver to an excretory process called the urea cycle. Its purpose is to detoxify and excrete excess ammonia. The process begins in the mitochondria and then mainly takes place in the cytosol. It's important to note that the cycle begins with carbamoyl phosphate, a molecule that combines CO2 and the ammonia from transamination, as well as ornithine. As we travel through the cycle, you'll notice that the goal is to remove nitrogen groups from the equation and regenerate ornithine for the next cycle to begin. At the end of the cycle, humans should have produced urea, a contained form of ammonia that can pass through the blood and excrete through the urine.